Hi there, welcome to week two. I hope you had an inspiring week one with our executives and some of the external speakers. In this week, we will talk about drivers for corporate sustainability. My name is Vikram Nagendra, and in this unit, I will cover the overview of some of the drivers. So let's get started. Every corporation needs a framework for their sustainability mission and North Star ambition setting. There are several frameworks used by corporations like the SDGs, planetary boundary concept, and so on. One of the holistic frameworks that incorporates both the environmental and social aspects is the donut model developed by K. Travel. Essentially, the model talks about two ceilings, the environmental ceiling on top with the nine planetary boundaries, beyond which lies unacceptable environmental degradation, and the social ceiling at the bottom with 12 dimensions inspired by the SDGs, below which lies unacceptable human deprivation. The middle is the sweet spot that offers the safe and just space for humanity. Corporate activities and decision-making need to consider both ceilings. A key activity in every corporate sustainability journey is the materiality analysis. The assessment, ideally performed along two dimensions, provide a holistic view of a company's impact areas of the economy, environment, and society. The first dimension, which is the inside-out view, is the impact that a corporation has on the economy, environment, and the society, so-called value to society. And the second dimension, which is the outside-in view, are all the impact areas that external stakeholders expect a corporation to manage well. This dimension also has an influence on companies' valuation, so-called value to business. When these two dimensions are represented on the X and Y axis, the prioritization of impact areas become obvious. Ideally, corporations need to prioritize their sustainability efforts along the prioritized material topics. Unit two of this week will cover materiality analysis in more detail. Another key component of corporate sustainability journeys are the regulatory requirements. Some of these requirements, especially related to ESG, are already effective and the new ones will become effective starting 2024. Compliance to these regulations requires significant effort and investments on the corporate side. That requires not only effective governance internally, but also the need to ensure limited or reasonable assurance through audits. One of the regulations that is already effective is the EU taxonomy. The regulations required corporations to prove that their economic activity not only substantially contributes to some of the environmental objectives, but also does not significantly harm other criteria and comply with minimum safeguards. As one of the first effective regulations in the ESG space, it encourages redirection of capitals to sustainable activities in the long run. Unit three of this week will cover this and other regulations in more detail. Another key driver of corporate sustainability efforts are the reporting frameworks, standards, and requirements that need to be met in the annual reports. These requirements are driven by either regulations, standard setters, international agreements, ratings and ranking providers, or in some cases by alliances and forums. Corporate commitment to some of these requirements is a matter of prioritization, capacity allocation, regional and local requirements, and so on. There are consolidation efforts ongoing on a regional and global level. On the global level, the consolidation and standardization is driven by the International Sustainability Standards Board, or ISSB, which is part of the IFRS Foundation. More on the reporting landscape and requirements will be covered in Unit 4 of this week. Climate change is a harsh reality that all corporations must face and hence one of the key drivers in the sustainability efforts. All corporations, regardless of the industry, size or location, are expected by stakeholders to reduce their value chain emissions. 
The contribution towards the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 degree pathway is seen as one of the key drivers for investments, talent attraction and retention, long-term value creation, and so on. Several corporations have made significant mid- and long-term commitments as per the Science Space Targets Initiative, or SPTI. As SAP, we have committed to become carbon neutral by end of 2023 and net zero by end of 2030, 20 years ahead of the original commitment. However, environmental sustainability goes beyond greenhouse gas management as potentially indicated by the materiality analysis. Air emissions, waste management, water consumption and pollution management and so on form a holistic environmental sustainability management. While concrete targets and standards like the ones for greenhouse gases are still emerging for these additional environmental KPIs, Corporations are already taking mid to long term view on these. Unit 5 of this week will cover this in more detail. The S part of the ESG, which is the social sustainability aspect, is gaining more importance and hence gaining significance as one of the key drivers for corporate sustainability efforts. As SAP, we commit to abide by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. On the regulatory side, the number of human rights-related compliance requirements are increasing. Examples are the German Human Rights due, due Diligence Law, UK and Australia's Modern Slavery Act, and so on. Human rights-related policies are a good way to manage in a missing regulatory environment. We have policies like the AI Ethics Policy, which governs all of our artificial intelligence-related work as an example. Corporate KPIs like the diversity, equity and inclusion, employee engagement, health and well-being, and so on, form the basic KPI framework to ensure that the social sustainability targets and achievements are measured in a consistent manner. Unit 6 of this week will cover this topic in more detail. Impact measurement and valuation is the next step in ESG management where corporate impacts on the economy, environment, and society are measured in monetary terms and embedded in decision-making with the financial performance. When sustainability performance is measured in the same language as financial performance, it becomes easier for decision-making and stakeholders to understand the trade-offs and help make holistic decisions. Impact management goes beyond output disclosures to understand the total impact of corporate activity. Value Balancing Alliance is an industry-led initiative to standardize the impact management methodologies. It is a practitioner, practitioner's lab of member companies that pilot methodologies in-house and share results with each other for mutual learning and best practices sharing. The results are used by the VBA towards regulatory uptake going forward. Impact management is a hot topic that is growing and several institutions are working towards its standardization and adoption. You will learn more about it in the unit seven of this week. That is the end of this unit. I hope you had a glimpse into some of the drivers for corporate sustainability. I will see you again in Unit 7 when I will explain impact measurement and valuation in more detail. I hope you enjoy the rest of the units in this week and see you soon. Bye. Welcome to week two, unit two, materiality. My name is Stephanie Rabe, and I will introduce you to the concept of materiality in the context of ESG steering and reporting. In this session, we will cover what materiality is, and for that, I've brought along a couple of definitions. We will talk about why materiality is important, and last but not least, I'll give you some insights into how SAP conducted a materiality assessment. The concept of materiality recognizes that some information is more important to shareholders and stakeholders than others and draws the line between what matters and what does not. Traditionally, the term materiality has been defined in the context of financial reporting and 
um, the definition is as follows. Information is material if omitting, misstating, or obscuring it could influence decisions that the readers of financial statements make on the basis of those information. When sustainability reporting evolved, it was clear that something similar was needed. And the organization accountability was one of the first organizations that provided a definition of sustainability materiality, which you can see on the right hand side of the slide. It is clear that uh, to make good decisions, an organization and its stakeholders need to know what issues are material to the sustainability performance of this company and to determine what is material an ongoing materiality determination process that is integrated in and applied across the organization is needed. Depending on the sector and um, um, the activities that a, a company conducts, the risks vary. So, for example, a software company like SAP um, has a very different set of material topics than a company, for example, in the retailing sector. Let's come to a definition of materiality that is widely used in sustainability reporting today, the definition provided by the GRI standards. The overall aim of the GRI standards is to help organizations communicate about the impact they have on the economy, the society and environment. And this provides stakeholders with information about organizations' contributions, be it positive or negative, towards the goal of sustainable development. The GRI's definition of materiality has also evolved over time, and uh, I've brought along the last two definitions from 2016 and 2020. The first one from 2016 um, led to the materiality matrices, um, which you can see on the screen as well, um, that have been part of past sustainability reports and where you can still find them often today. With the change of the definition in 2020, um, the GRI has increased the emphasis of identifying those topics that relate to impact. An impact, according to the GRI, refers to the effect that an organization has on the economy, environment or society. It does not refer to an effect upon the organization because of what it does, for example, on its reputation. When identifying those material impacts, companies still have to consider the feedback of stakeholders, even if it's not explicitly part of the definition any longer. Now let's come to the point where financial materiality and ESG materiality come closer together. For a long time, companies have ass assessed both concepts of materiality independent from each other and have not drawn a connection between the two. And this connection is now embedded in the concept of double materiality, which was first introduced by the European Union in the regulation that was called the EU Non-Financial Reporting Directive. And this regulation or this definition of materiality recognizes that issues that are material to environmental and social obje objectives may also develop to have financial consequences over time. I'll try to explain this based um, on the example of climate change. So from a financial materiality perspective, climate related information should be reported if it's necessary for an understanding of the development of the financial performance of a company. This is um, typically most interesting to um, financial investors. So, for example, if a company is in a carbon intensive sector and has to heavily invest into transitioning into a low carbon economy um, because of regulatory requirements, then this has financial effects and therefore is interesting to investors. Under um, environmental materiality, however, climate related information should be reported if it's necessary for an understanding of the external effects of the company. So this is um, information that is required, for example, by NGOs or um, governments, but also by, um, by consumers and customers. And also an increasing number of investors considers this information um, relevant. 
<clears throat> because they also try to better understand and measure the climate impacts of their investment portfolios. So for example, if a company misses to transition to a low carbon economy, they are responsible for continuously contributing to, to climate change, with, which is the impact on the economy. At the same time, this could be an indication to investors that this is not a viable business model and uh, or if the company refuses to reduce its environmental impact. So these two concepts of materiality, financial materiality and environmental and social materiality, already overlap in some cases and are increasingly likely to do so um, as markets and public policies evolve in response to climate change the positive and negative impacts of a company on the climate will increasingly translate into business opportunities or risks that are also financially material. Now, the European Union has also further developed this um, concept of double materiality. They have confirmed the term materiality to describe the intersection of financial materiality and what they now call impact materiality. So for financial materiality, um, it is a topic is material if it triggers financial effects on a company or if it generates risks or opportunities that um, influence the enterprise value over the short, mid or long term. And from the impact materiality perspective, a topic is material if the undertaking is connected to actual or potential significant impacts on people, the environment and the economy across its whole value chain. Now let's come to the question, why do companies um, conduct materiality analysis? The definitions that I have provided come from um, reporting standards. However, if you take materiality seriously, then it should actually be the basis for a sustainability strategy. It should strengthen the company's strategy by understanding the business context holistically and considering stakeholders' feedback. Um, then, of course, materiality analyses need to be done to be compliant with reporting standards. And in the end, um, it's also the basis for starting impact measurement and valuation, understanding what are actually the positive and the negative impacts the company has on economy, society and environment. Now I will talk a little bit about how we at SAP conducted our materiality analysis. When we started our analysis, we took guidance from the Global Reporting Initiative's um, process description, but also uh, when it comes to definitions. Our process in 2022 contained four steps, which I will describe a little bit more in detail. First, we deepen our understanding of our industry, um, <clears throat> of what we produce, and who are actually our important stakeholders. In the second step, we identified actual potential impacts on the environment, economy, and society, with a special consideration of human rights. We screened the GRI and SASB standards and many more industry-relevant data during this process. We also made use of an artificial intelligence tool that helped us analyze the data. The result was a very long list of potentially um, material topics. And then in the next step, we assessed the significance of the impact of each and every topic on our long list. And to do that, we took both the perspectives of financial materiality that we also call the outside in perspective, and um, we also considered um, the impact materiality or uh, what we call the um, inside out perspective. Now for this step, we grouped experts from different areas like HR or finance, um, compliance solutions to discuss the impact of a topic on SAP, but also SAP's impact on the topic. So the assessment was based um, to a large degree on expert judgment but we also added information from our pilot of impact measurement and valuation, which you will learn more about in the session week two, um, unit seven. In a fourth step, we combined the previous two assessments 
and um, <clears throat> also applied thresholds because the list was still too long um, to cover all of the topics in our reporting. Now, the result in 2021 looked like this, but as I record the session, um, the latest results for our 2022 analysis are not yet available. So I invite you to read the SAP Integrated Report 2022 and see the results of our latest materiality analysis there. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and say goodbye. Welcome to week two, unit three of this Open SAP course. My name is Gerhard Losgren, and I'm working in SAP's Business Transformation Services, which is SAP's management consultancy on the topics of sustainability and intelligent business technologies. Today, I want to talk to you on the topic of sustainable finance. When digging a little bit deeper what sustainable finance is about, we have to go back in time in the year 2015, where the Paris Agreement has been signed. All of you might know about the 1.5 centigrade goal that has been set there, limiting the increase of temperature worldwide. On the other hand, there is also a topic of adapting to the climate change, which is already happening. But a not so commonly known point is, that the financial market should also be considered and financial flows should be put in the right direction to support the goals of the Paris Agreement. In order to do so, um, we will have a more macroeconomic look on that topic. The regulators and authorities are currently setting up regulations that are affecting investors. Investors should now look into their portfolios where the money is invested in, and whether these investments are supporting the goals of the Paris Agreement or other environmental goals. By doing so, a kind of pressure is um, created to the financial market. This pressure um, is giving back to the real economy because the financial market now seeks for investments and financial assets that are fulfilling certain criteria. So whenever a real economy company is going to set up a new project with classical, for example, fossil fuel energy activities, that might in the end be more expensive to get financing for it because it's not fulfilling the goal. But when you come to a point where a project is supporting the goal, it should be in the end, more you know, supported by the financial market with better conditions for financing. So in the end, by setting up such kind of regulations, the pressure on the real economy to change is getting higher and higher. How to measure all these kind of activities? Yeah, there's a lot what we can currently do. There are so, so many frameworks out there which um, are more or less going in the same direction in order to classify business activities, show how businesses are done in the right way. Companies should, of course, first consider regulatory um, topics which are mandatory. Then there, of course, are different voluntary standards which are widely accepted by the financial market. On top of that, there are certain regulators which are picking these voluntary standards and try to set them into force. And then, of course, a lot of other initiatives um, from business groups or from rating agencies that are also want to get clarification on how businesses are doing their operational business and how they support sustainable um, activities. Picking the EU taxonomy as one of the currently uh, most stretched or stressed topics in the um, European Union um, that is based on the Green Deal that is, came out in 2020, where the European Union wanted to invest a huge amount of money into transforming all business activities within the European Union to become more sustainable and 
support the goal, Paris, goals of the Paris Agreement. That is not only considering the money the EU is spending, it is also considering the money that European countries are spending to support the goals. And it is also considering private investments. So you can imagine there's a lot of money in the market and where a lot of money in the market, where when there is a lot of money in the market, you can imagine there's a risk of greenwashing. Everybody wants a share of it, but is all of these done in the right and proper way? It is a bit of a question. In order to avoid this kind of greenwashing and yeah, to set rules and give guidance what is a sustainable business activity, the EU came up with the taxonomy, which is a rule set um, explaining categories of business activities and how they are put in place or operated in the right way. The topic is complex by itself, but in the end, it's all going down to financial disclosures of business activities. So first of all, most of the large companies which are falling under the non-financial reporting directive have to disclose what kind of business activities from the point of view of the taxonomy are eligible, taxonomy eligible. Then the companies have to look deeper into are we fulfilling certain criteria to become taxonomy aligned. From fiscal year 2021 onwards, so for the disclosure period in 22, the first companies had to do this. In future, also companies which will fall under the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, have to follow. So a lot of lot more companies will also disclose in the same manner. When it comes to the real economy, first of all, the companies have to disclose their portion taxonomy eligible and afterwards taxonomy aligned on their turnover, capex and opex. When this data is available, the financial market can consume it. And that is not limited to the insurance um, companies and um, bank, uh, banking companies. It is also going to asset managers and the like, which are falling under the SFDR. Yes, how does this mechanic in the end work? First of all, the EU put in the center of this activity six environmental goals. So far, two have been set into so-called delegated acts. And this is all about climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. So very close to the Paris Agreement and the goals of the Paris Agreement. Within the taxonomy, there is now a linkage between these sustainable, sustainability goals of the EU and business activities. And the taxonomy is now describing when a company is doing a substantial contribution to one of these goals by doing a certain business um, activity in the right way. While doing a certain business activity in the right way to support, for example, climate change mitigation, we have to ensure still that the other five goals are not harmed. This in the end means that you have so-called do no significant harm criteria, which are yeah, protecting the other five goals from being harmed. So doing something good for climate change mitigation will also ask you not to pollute, pollute water resources or harm biodiversity, for example. As these are only economic goals, the EU also put in place the so-called minimum social safeguards. Minimum social safeguards are referring to the OECD principles and UN guidelines, which are um, looking after forced labor, child labor, how to handle conflict minerals and all these things. Whenever you come to the conclusion that you are fulfilling all these criteria for your business activities, then you are allowed to disclose your turnover, your capital expenditure, your operating expenditure to um, as taxonomy aligned. 
it is unfortunately not that easy because regular or currently used financial standards are not looking in this kind of granularity. When you are disclosing uh, and you are creating a balance sheet, you will not have this kind of information as you need for the taxonomy. The granularity of the taxonomy is good for a good reason, because you have to see where the business is happening. So you have to go down to production plans, for example, or in the case of SAP to data centers. And the point is that mostly this is not linked to the revenue in the end. So whatever generates the revenue is normally not seen in the financial statement. And that is what uh, one of the major points um, or challenges that we have here is to get in the real economy this linkage between the most granular sustainability activity or sustainability criteria and to the financial figures. On the other hand, on the financial market side, it's also not very easy to get the information of the so-called use of proceeds to your financial asset you are in, um, assessing. Normally, that is not uh, really given. And that will also change over time that financial market participants will ask about this data when financial assets are created, credits, loans, bonds, and so on. But giving you more an outlook on the other topics that are also going on. We already have seen there are a lot of standards in place, but there are two more or three more actually that are coming up um, and that are affecting corporations across the world. On the left hand side, you have the ISSB, IFRS activities where sustainability should also be included into financial accounting. On the middle side, this is the SEC, which is taking care about the financial markets in the US, wants to incorporate climate risk also in the disclosures of the listed companies in the US. And the EFRAG, the switch is setting up European sustainability reporting standards, also asked for additional information, which is going over the scope of the EU taxonomy. They are also referring to already existing standards, but what we recommend companies to do is really look into the large standards that are currently developed to get the holistic view. How do we support this at SAP? And you will get a glimpse on this in the other following sessions. This is um, the sustainable finance solution architecture, which I have here on a very high level. You have the SAP solutions as a basis where you will find all this information and below also non-SAP systems. So we have finance information, you have sustainability information, there's organizational structures already in there. And this is then consolidated in one data layer, which can um, support all these kind of frameworks. For example, the EU taxonomy. And my colleagues will give you a glimpse on how this technically will work. And therefore, I will come to the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and got some information and some insights to sustainable finance. Take care and goodbye. Hello, and welcome to unit four of this course. In this unit, we are going to have a look at SAP's integrated report and the most important sustainability regulations influencing this report. My name is Tobias Groß. I'm a member of Corporate Financial Reporting and I'm also one of the co-leads for SAP's integrated report project. Now, first of all, let's have a look at SAP's reporting history. We started our journey back in 1988 with our first annual report. This report was quite a short report, basically containing only balance sheet and profit or loss statement. Um, and in 2007, we released our first sustainability report, now also providing insights into SAP's environmental and social performance. 
A year after that, the decision was taken to no longer print the sustainability report, rather publish it online only. In 2011, we uh, started to combine the sustainability report and the annual report, and we moved contents from the sustainability report in the annual report. However, at this point in time, we still released two reports, so the sustainability report and the annual report. And obviously, this is not the most effective way uh, to do reporting. Uh, and so a year after that, in 2012, um, we decided to only release one report um, covering both the sustainability perspective and the financial perspective. So the idea of this now called integrated report is to convey a holistic picture covering both the financial perspective and the environmental and social perspective. And we've been doing that for quite a while now. In 2021, we released SAP's 10th integrated report. And that's also what I uh, want to show you on this slide here. Um, again, the idea of uh, integrated reporting is to provide a holistic picture um, showing not only the financial view, uh, but also the environmental and, and social impacts of a, of a company. Um, in 2021, also for the first time, we included disclosures uh, regarding the EU taxonomy for sustainable finance, but I don't want to go into too much detail here because there is a separate unit in this course dealing with the EU taxonomy. Uh, what I want to point out is that SAP's integrated report is prepared completely in-house by SAP. Um, SAP employees are doing this end-to-end -end, uh, using SAP software um, and uh, we are creating a PDF which is then published on SAP's integrated report website. You can see this website here. And obviously, uh, as a software company, our focus is on the online report. And in fact, for the last two years, we have not been printing the report anymore. So it's published online or exclusively online. Um, so we are creating this PDF. This PDF is then published on, on the website. Uh, and the website also contains additional complementing uh, information. Again, here you can see the three different views or the three different perspectives, uh, the financial view, the social view, and also the environmental view. Um, and if you're interested in, in one of those, you can also scroll down here. Uh, and here again, we have the financial view. Uh, if you want to drill down, you can click here. And then it will bring you to our financial statements uh, where you can uh, take a closer look at uh, SAP's balance sheet, SAP's profit and loss statement, and, and all the other uh, important financial KPIs that we are disclosing. You can do the same thing um, for social aspects or also for environment, environmental aspects. Uh, so let me click here. And here you can see now uh, you have more details, for instance, uh, regarding carbon emissions, uh, our science-based target, or the energy consumption. Uh, there's always the possibility to even drill down further. Uh, so just click here on Read More, and it will bring you directly to our uh, integrated report, or more specifically to the PDF um, of the integrated report. Uh, and, and, there, and there you can find uh, really uh, a lot of uh, information or further information regarding those, those topics. Um, an interesting feature uh, of our integrated report, which I also want to show you in brief, is the chart generator. So if I click here, um, I have the possibility to build my own chart. So uh, let's say I am interested in SAP's um, environmental performance again. 
um, and then specifically in the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, or I could also select here energy, energy consumption or renewable energy. Let's um, go with greenhouse gas emissions for now. Uh, and then you can see here this chart, uh, which provides an overview of the development of the total emissions. And you can now customize this chart according to your own liking. For instance, down here, uh, there are further possibilities uh, to select. Um, and let's say you're only interested in the scope 2 emissions, uh, then we can deselect scope 1 here. Uh, and let's say we're only interested in the Americas region, then we can pick that here accordingly. Uh, and then you have kind of customized the chart and now you can also uh, download this chart and also the underlying uh, data. So my recommendation would be uh, check out the, uh, the integrated report. You can find it online. Just uh, use Google, type in SAP integrated report and it will bring you to the site here. Um, and uh, do a little of exploring for your own. Uh, try to uh, use also the chart generator. Um, I can only highly recommend it because here you get a lot of details a lot of insights into the most important KPIs that uh, SAP is publishing. And uh, as you've seen, there's also the, uh, this, this nice interactive feature where uh, you can build your own charts. All right, let's jump back into uh, our presentation. Um, now you might ask, okay, why is SAP putting so much effort into integrated reporting? After all, integrated reporting is voluntary, so it's not mandatory. So why is SAP going down this extra mile um, and um, computing, calculating, publishing all this uh, sustainability data? Well, uh, there are a couple of reasons. Um, one reason, and, and that's the basic idea of integrated reporting, is to convey a holistic picture of SAP's performance. Uh, and, and this performance is not only about the financial view, it, it also includes the social and environmental view. And um, we are conveying this picture in our integrated reports. So that's the overall idea of, of integrated reporting. Um, also, since SAP is a software company, of course, we want to be seen as an innovator, as a thought leader, as a kind of a front runner. And that's also why we are really pushing this idea of integrated reporting and sustainability reporting in, in general. There's also a business component uh, to that because the integrated report is a, is a great way uh, to promote the sustainability portfolio or the sustainability solutions um, that SAP is, is, is actually offering. And last but not least, we're doing this because there's demand for this kind of information. So important stakeholders like investors, like employees, they are asking for, for, for this kind of um, information. So uh, for us, it's important to also provide them with this kind of information, because in the end, we want to continue to have access uh, to vital resources like uh, employees, like uh, money on capital markets. And if those stakeholders are, ask for this specific kind of information, um, we will, of course, also provide it um, to them. And um, here you can see that uh, it's, it's not only nice words. Uh, so um, SAP's strategy is uh, really embracing sustainability. Uh, because what you can see here is that from or out of the five uh, strategic objectives um, that SAP is disclosing in its integrated report, uh, three of those KPIs or objectives are non-financial objectives. Uh, customer loyalty, employee engagement, carbon impact, um, and, and they are treated in the same way as the financial KPIs are treated they have the same assurance level. Um, we are providing an outlook uh, for, for those KPIs. And of course, this outlook and the actuals are discussed in, in our integrated reports. So, uh, so it becomes transparent to everyone how SAP or how SAP's performance is in the area of those non-financial KPIs. 
All right. So now what are the most uh, important um, frameworks or sustainability regulations uh, for SAP's integrated report? Um, the, most, the most important one is um, probably the standards from, from the Global Reporting Initiative, um, the GRI standards. Um, it's a set of internationally accepted sustainability reporting standards, uh, and they are also the basis for our non-financial statement, which is included in SAP's integrated report. Um, then I already talked about that briefly. Of course, we are heavily um, influenced or SAP is, is subject to the rules and regulations uh, from the European Union, uh, such as the EU taxonomy. Um, and what we are also trying to do on a voluntary basis is to show uh, what impacts SAP's um, business has on the society and on the environment. Now, um, there's a lot of uh, change and momentum currently going on in the field of sustainability reporting. Um, specifically, the European Union, they have uh, released uh, a lot of new regulations. One of those is the EU taxonomy, as I already explained. Uh, just very, very briefly, what is the taxonomy about? Um, the idea of the taxonomy is um, to identify the activities of a company that are um, that are actually sustainable. So uh, companies have to uh, disclose the share of capital expenditures, uh, of turnover, of operating expenditures that is relating to sustainable activities. And, and this way investors can see um, whether companies um, are um, are, are dealing in, in, in activities that are sustainable or, or not. But uh, there are also other um, key players in, in the field of, of sustainability reporting. And as I said, uh, there's currently a lot of momentum going on. And we have a lot of organizations uh, which are releasing uh, new standards in the field of sustainability reporting. Um, for SAP as a European company, one of the most important are, of course, the rules and regulations from the European Union. Uh, one of those um, is the EU taxonomy regulation, uh, but also the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, um, which will be effective for reporting years um, for the re reporting year 2024. Um, the CSRD. Uh, includes also quite an extensive set of new sustainability reporting standards. Um, the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, the ESRS. Uh, and um, as I said, they are really quite extensive uh, and it will be also challenging for, um, for the preparers to uh, fulfill those requirements. Similar um, uh, things are going on in the United States, uh, where the um, SEC has uh, released uh, a draft uh, of new standards requiring companies to disclose uh, their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, on an international level, we have the uh, International um, um, Sustainability uh, um, Standards Board. Uh, which is also working right now on a set of new uh, sustainability uh, standards um, uh, that need to be taken into consideration by, um, by international companies. So, as I said, there's a lot of momentum currently in the field of um, sustainability reporting um, and uh, a lot of new uh, requirements that uh, SAP and, and other bigger companies will have to comply with uh, in the next couple of years. All right, um, that's it um, with, with my presentation. Uh, thank you for, for watching this unit. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, you found it interesting. Welcome to week two, unit five. 
My name is Markus Wagner and I'm responsible for all environmental sustainability initiatives at SAP. Today, I will talk about net zero, one of the most challenging environmental issues to foster a low carbon and circular future. What is the purpose of this net zero session? The training should help you to understand what SAP's net zero commitment is. What are differences between net zero and carbon neutrality targets? How the transformation roadmap will look like? And what challenges we are facing along our own journey to become a net zero company? Let's start with the definition on the term net zero. Net zero refers to a state in which the greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere are balanced out of the atmosphere by permanent removals. SAP has committed to achieve net zero along our value chain, in line with the 1.5 degrees Celsius future in 2030, 20 years earlier than originally targeted. This means we have to drive global environmental challenges now and not leave it to our next generation. In the next sec section, I would like to explain our greenhouse gas value chain emissions and the difference between carbon neutrality and net zero. Greenhouse gas emissions are divided into three scopes. Scope 1, direct emissions from owned or controlled sources. Scope 2, indirect emissions from the generation of purchased energy. And scope 3 emissions, all other indirect emissions in your value chain, including upstream and downstream. Another visual visualization is to disclose the greenhouse gas emissions along the value chain. Please see the SAP example in front of you. Upstream emissions, operations and downstream emissions. The focus of carbon neutrality is to optimize the own operations, for example, to avoid and reduce electricity consumption in offices or data centers and the reduction of emissions caused by company cars. At SAP, Scope 1 and 2 emissions in our own operations are very small, roughly 2%. Key impacts are Scope 3 emissions along the entire upstream and downstream value chain. Therefore, the scope of net zero is much broader. Focus are entire value chain emissions, including all up and downstream emissions. Two examples, the orange box on the left side Greenhouse gas category purchase goods and services and capital goods means all cradle to gate emissions in our supply chain, responsible for around 12% of our emissions. Secondly, the blue box, greenhouse gas category use of sold products means our emissions caused by our own premise software solutions, running in the data center environment of our customers, responsible for 84% of our emissions. In numbers, our net emissions in our own operations were 110,000 tons in 2021. The entire greenhouse gas value chain emissions were 10 million tons, means 90 times more. So a little scientific lecture might be a good thing. Net zero follows certain frameworks and standards. The science-based target initiative is the most common standard to define and model greenhouse gas emission pathways to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The SBTI Science-Based Target Initiative was founded in strong partnership with Carbon Disclosure Project, the World Resource Institute, WWF, and the UN Global Compact. Companies should define near-term and long-term emission reduction targets in line with the 1.5 pathways. The science-based target net zero standard defines rules and practices on potential abatements within the value chains, removal activities, or beyond value chain mitigation, such as investments in classical carbon offsets, for example, forest protection projects. The world's biggest companies are committed to the science-based target initiative, like we do. As mentioned, Net Zero has to focus on entire value chain emissions of the company with clear reduction pathways. Therefore, companies need to define reduction targets year over year. There are defined rules for mitigation and compensation strategies. Most important, 
companies have to reduce its emissions by at least 90%. Residual emissions can be neutralized with 10% max. Companies have to focus on avoidance and reductions, like the increase of the share of renewable electricity. Permanence is the key issue. Investments in classical carbon compensation like forest protections are very, are very important, classified as beyond value chain mitigation. Removals are key focus in the upcoming years. For example, reforestations, new removal, removal technology approaches like direct air capturing or carbon capture and storage. What does it mean for SAP? We have to reduce our absolute greenhouse gas emission value chain from 10 million tons to less than 1 million tons by 2030. How do we plan to drive the net zero transformation at SAP? Define targets in line with business strategy. Secondly, integrate the net zero ambition in our core business activities. And thirdly, embed steering elements like connecting financials and non-financials, define KPIs and compensation structures for the executive board or executives. Let's come to the next part. What are the key initiatives to become net zero by 2030? We see three important areas, cloud transformation, sustainable supply chain actions, and finally drive best in class operations. SAP started already the journey some years ago. Two examples, since 2014, we power our offices and data centers with 100% renewable electricity already. We started the journey to a zero emission car fleet organization by providing various sustainable mobility options or electric cars as company cars. However, let's share some more insights. Number one and most important area, the acceleration of our cloud transformation from, from on-prem to cloud and the reinforce of our commitment to power internal and external data centers with 100% renewable electricity. Drive sustainable programming initiatives to reduce energy consumption of our cloud and on-premise solutions. The second part is about supply chain. Strengthen the engagement with our key suppliers to use as well 100% renewables and deliver net zero products and services. Consider net zero requirements in business travel events and other business related activities. Finally, enhance investments into new removal technologies and investments. Finally, best in class operations, zero emission car fleet and new sustainable mobility alternatives. Drive energy efficiencies and programs in our facilities and data center management and embed net zero requirements into various policies like procurement, travel, car fleet or mobility. To drive our net zero transformation, it needs some governance elements as well. Governance and stakeholder management is really key. Having a clear mandate from the executive board and the buy-in is from your most relevant lines of business is important. Net zero is not only a topic of the sustainability department. You need strong support of areas like controlling, procurement, travel, facility management, IT, communication, and others. Secondly, monitoring and steering. Define KPIs and initiatives and include these into your core business activities and develop and provide a monitoring platform. Finally, as always, communications, classical internal and external communication, but more and more stakeholders and investors would like to see your targets and progress. It's also about the external disclosure of your KPIs and progress. Let's come to challenges and opportunities we ob observed in the past years. Some key aspects. Analyze net zero standards for your business and industries because there are always changes to come. Define an accurate baseline because this is the base for your multi-year transformation and KPI setting. 
And finally, important to adjust and expand existing reporting structure, structures from traditional operations to full value chain reporting and steering. The role of data is very, very important. Dashboards and transparency can help. Why? This gains trust. And if you have trust, you can go for better business decisions and drive the change. At SAP, we use our solutions to manage our entire carbon reporting from data collection, greenhouse gas calculation and allocation, audit, reporting and disclosure. For more questions, please have a look to our SAP Sustainability Control Tower solution. I would like to close the Net Zero session with some final words. First of all, Net Zero is a journey and not a one-time event. Secondly, the integration in value chains of your company is key. And thirdly, define your pathways to drive holistic reporting and steering. However, I can only encourage all corporates to consider mid and long-term net zero targets to drive the change and help the world run better. Thanks a lot for your attention and all the best. Welcome to week two, unit six. Today, I will talk about human rights due diligence in the context of ESG steering and reporting. We will talk about what humans, human rights are, how business can impact human rights, why human rights due diligence is relevant in the context of ESG steering and reporting, and how SAP addresses human rights due diligence. The articulation of human rights started with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a milestone document in the history of human rights that was proclaimed by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948. It officially recognized that basic rights and fundamental freedoms are inherent to all human beings, inalienable and equally applicable to everyone, Everyone is entitled to these rights without discrimination. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights lays out the 30 human rights that you can see on this slide, but there are more rights as defined in other documents that we will talk about a little bit later. Now, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was designed, it considered states to be responsible for respecting, protecting and fulfilling those rights. So what do business have to do with human rights? Let's pause for a moment and think about how employers affect their employees' rights. Here are some examples of how human rights play a role at the workplace. So employers should pay their employees a living wage or provide sufficient breaks and vacation days to prevent negative health effects. Employers should also not tolerate any discrimination or harassment and should allow workers to present their interest in an organized way. Enterprises can affect the human rights of their workers, of their own workers, of contract workers, of their customers, of workers in the supply chain, um, communities around their operations, but also of the customers that actually use their products and services. They can have an impact, be positive or negative, on basically all human rights, on all internationally recognized human rights. In practice, some of the rights will be more relevant than others in particular industries and circumstances, and companies will pay more attention to them. But in principle, any enterprise could cause or contribute to an adverse impact on any right, especially when they operate globally, including in poor countries and conflict affected areas. The frameworks that I mentioned here on this slide provide the basic reference points for business to start thinking and understanding um, about what human rights are. These documents are also mentioned in the United Nations Guiding Principles um, on business and human rights, or the UNGPs. 
as well as the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. I specifically mention these two documents because they lay out the specific responsibilities that companies have to respect human rights. The OECD also publishes sector-specific guidelines for industry with a high risk for human rights violations. Now let's have a closer look um, at the UNGPs. The UNGPs are the global standard for preventing and addressing the risk of adverse impacts on human rights linked to business activities. The UNGPs are founded on three pillars. First, the state duty to protect human rights against abuse by third parties, including business. Second, the corporate responsibility to respect rights, which means that companies need to seek to avoid infringing on the rights of others and address adverse impacts. And third, access to effective remedy, both judicial and non-judicial, for victims of business-related human rights abuses. The UN Guiding Principles also provide guidance on what companies need to do to be able to respect human rights. And companies should have in place a policy commitment to respect human rights, a human rights due diligence process, and processes to provide or enable remedy to those harmed in the event that the company causes or contributes to a negative impact. Let's have a closer look at due diligence. As set out in the guiding principles, human rights due diligence is a process for identifying, preventing, mitigating and accounting for human rights impacts. This includes both actual impacts occurring in the past, but also present or potential impacts that could occur in the future. A key component of meaningful due diligence is meaningful engagement with um, stakeholders particularly rights holders, such as employees, communities, um, supply chain workers, or consumers. The human rights due diligence process itself includes four core components. The first is um, identifying and assessing actual or potential adverse impacts that the company may cause, contribute to, or linked to. Second, taking appropriate action and integrating findings from impact assessments across relevant company processes. Third, tracking the effectiveness of measures in order to assess whether they're working. And fourth, communicating about stakeholders, which impacts were identified, how they were addressed, and whether there are adequate policies and processes in place. Taking action to respect and promote human rights is essential for companies to contribute meaningfully to the people part of sustainable development, lifting people into lives of dignity, equality and opportunity. Why is it useful then um, to consider human rights in ESG steering and reporting? Well, um, considering human rights in risk management helps to avoid business disruptions, litigation or reputational harm. It is, however, very important to understand that the meaning of risk in human rights due diligence is very different from the traditional understanding of risk um, in companies. So companies usually evaluate risk based on risk to the companies and financial implications for the companies. Risk in the context of human rights due diligence, however, means to change perspectives and requires to change perspectives because it is risk to people that needs to be evaluated um, in the context of human rights due diligence. More and more countries consider introducing legislation um, or have already done so like the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act or the um, European Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive um, that is currently under development. Um, the legislation, like the German one, does not only apply um, to German companies at their headquarters, but it will actually have a trickle-down effect in their supply chains too, and it has to be applied globally. The legislation often requires related disclosures 
and companies need to be able to have a system in place that allows for this reporting. Unfortunately, as of today, um, human rights KPIs are less mature than environmental or other social KPIs. And um, the standard setters for reporting also started with environmental reporting as it is more mature. But I expect this area to evolve rapidly in connection with the evolving landscape of legislation. And the evolving landscape of legislation is displayed here on this slide. Um, the only note to this is that um, this picture or this slide was drafted in August 2022. So whenever you listen to this recording, please make sure that you get an um, up-to-date version um, of human rights legislation because I'm sure it has evolved by then. Now let's come to SAP and our commitment to human rights. So we at SAP want to proactively ensure compliance with existing and upcoming um, regulations, while we have also committed to the UNGPs and the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. That means that um, we have identified human rights due diligence legislation applicable to SAP on a global level and checked gaps that um, had to be filled by SAP. Based on that, we have revamped our risk assessment process and um, designed prevention and mitigation measures covering SAP's own operations and our supply chain. For the latter, we make use, for example, of the SAP Ariba supplier risk tool. But we do not want to stop with legal requirements, but want to go beyond that and also evaluate risks related to our customers and our solutions, um, what we would also call downstream due diligence. We have expanded our um, complaints mechanism that we had already in place to make it available to all stakeholders outside and inside SAP, and to not only be able to report, for example, cases of corruption, but also human rights incidents. We have started then um, to prepare for mandatory documentation and reporting, um, which is quite challenging because there are different timelines and different contents required throughout different legislations. We have also started a change management work stream in our overall approach because we wanted to ensure that we enable our colleagues globally to join our efforts. And last but not least, we have implemented a permanent governance model that makes it clear that human rights due diligence um, cannot be driven by one single department alone. Instead, it is a cross-company effort with various facets that needs the involvement, for example, of your procurement, de procurement department, risk management department, human resources, product development, and a lot more. To sum it up, SAP is committed to respecting and promoting human rights across our operations, our supply chain, and um, our products and solutions. We set high standards of fairness, diversity, and inclusion for ourselves and expect all our business partners to do the same. Respect for human rights is central to our long-term commitment to sustainability and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as well as core to how we execute on our purpose to help the world run better and improve people's lives. For more details, check out the SAP Integrated Report at www.sapintegratedreport.com. Welcome to week two, unit seven. This is the last unit of this week. I hope you enjoyed all the units in this week. My name is Vikram Nagendra, and in this unit, we will de uh, dive a little deeper into the topic of impact measurement and valuation. Let's get started. So what is impact? There are several definitions of impact. We derive the definition from OECD. According to OECD, the impact of an organization is the effect it has on the condition of the natural environment and the well-being of people. These impacts can be positive, which means it improves the condition, or negative, which means it worsens the condition. 
These impacts can be created intentionally through business decisions or unintentionally as indirect or induced effects. Impact management, on the other hand, is to consciously manage all the impacts holistically to ensure that the negative effects are minimized and positive impacts are maximized. The intention is to go beyond avoiding harm to doing good, to move from profit maximization to value optimization. Let's look at this in more detail. Let's talk about what impact measurement and valuation is and where does it fit in today's ESG understanding. Let's start with talking about today's scope of traditional reporting. Most sustainability or integrated reporting is focused on disclosing the outputs created by a corporation. Examples of outputs are the tons of greenhouse gas emissions, amount of water consumed from different regions, air emissions from different manufacturing plants, hours of training and education provided, and so on. While this is a great starting point, we have to understand that beyond the corporate outputs, there's also corporate impacts. For example, what is the outcome on the environment and impact on human society for every additional ton of greenhouse gas emitted by the corporation? And the question of how to measure these impacts that allows comparability and integration into decision making by monetizing these impacts in US dollar terms or euro terms or any other currency, corporations can include their impacts side by side financial performance, allowing holistic decision and clear trade off transparency. Impact measurement and valuation goes beyond pure output disclosures into understanding the total impact a corporation is creating and measuring them in monetary terms. Let's look at one concrete example. On this slide, you see an impact pathway for greenhouse gas emissions. On the left side of the pathway, the input and the outputs are very clear for us as corporations. Inputs are everything that goes into building products and services. And outputs are, for example, the tons of greenhouse gas emissions. For every ton of greenhouse gas emission, based on decades of scientific research, we know that there are environmental outcomes and impacts on, on human society. Outcomes like rising mean temperatures, shifting climate patterns, sea level rises, etc., et have a direct impact on human society. For example, there is desertification on one, one side of the world, uh, resulting in losses of productive and habitable land, and there are flooding on the other parts of the world. We know it has an impact on agriculture and timber, for example. These outcome and impacts can be valued in monetary terms using scientific methodologies, and in this case, for example, the social cost of carbon. The social cost of carbon methodology allows translating the corporate outputs, which are in tons of greenhouse gases, into a monetary impact, which considers the outcomes and impacts on the environment and the society. This slide provides an example of the calculation logic for determining monetized impact. It starts with operational data from the company as well as the value chain like greenhouse gas emissions, water consumptions, air emissions, health and safety information, and so on. The primary information is complemented by external data, especially as proxy for potentially missing primary information. The sources of external data could be input-output tables, LCA databases, and other sources of information. The calculation logic for each KPI is then applied to determine the impacts. Valuation coefficients are, are then used to translate the impacts to monetary terms. One example is the greenhouse gas emission that we discussed. Here, the tons of emitted greenhouse gas emissions are complemented with external data and multiplied with the social cost of carbon calculation logic and valuation coefficient to determine the social impact of each ton of greenhouse gas as well as its corresponding monetary value. There are several good reasons 
for monetizing impacts in US dollar terms or euro terms or any other currency for that matter. First and foremost, we know that deep understanding of sustainable impact requires scientific and anthropological understanding. Many business leaders and decision makers are not trained in these fields. Moreover, when several sustainability KPIs across the environment and social um, factors are required to be managed, it becomes impossible to fully understand the overall impact of decisions. Monetization lowers the hurdle for leaders and decision makers by translating the different sustainability impacts into a common language that they are used to already. Secondly, businesses process, business processes like investment opportunities, risk exposures, uh, resource allocation, and so on operate in financial terms. Monetized impacts allow direct integration into these business processes without the necessity for many explanations. Next, trade-offs are part of everyday business activity. And what's on the table to trade off really matters to ensure that all aspects of business, especially its impact on the environment and the society are considered. Monetization allows sustainability impacts to be part of the trade off decisions. And finally, monetization allows easy target setting, disclosure towards the target and ensuring decisions are made in favor of achieving the targets. There are several institutions working on developing impact management topic. One of them is the Value Balancing Alliance, which I briefly covered in unit one of this week. The VBA was co-founded by SAP with other multinational organizations across the globe, and today there are over 25 member companies. The objective is to create a global impact measurement and valuation standard for monetizing and disclosing the impacts of corporate activity. It is a practitioner's lab. That means all member companies are expected to pilot latest methodologies using real company data, use the results in decision-making and disclosures, and share non-sensitive information to the VBA. The VBA then uses the consolidated and anonymized results towards advocacy. The member companies also share their experiences and expertise with each other through dedicated peer learning sessions. Harvard Business School's Impact Weighted Account Initiative is another project looking at developing and standardizing impact measurement and valuation topic. Their mission is to drive the creation of financial accounts that reflect a company's financial, social, and environmental performance. While the Value Balancing Alliance's target group are corporations, the target group for Harvard's initiative are the investors. More on this initiative can be found on their webpage. So where does that leave SAP? Uh, when we look at the evolution of our ESG journey, before 2009, we were all about financial reporting. And we were predominantly answering the question how much revenue does this new product generate? In 2012, we introduced the first integrated report. Um, and this brought the financial and non-financial performance together to answer predominantly the question, for example, what is the carbon footprint of this new product? And as we implement and learn from the impact measurement and valuation journey, our ambition is to answer the question, what is the total impact of this product on the environment, the society, and the economy? So that is the end of this unit and this week. I hope you enjoyed all the units of this week and looking forward for week three. Thank you and goodbye.